Okay, this next video uh, makes me uh, feel that Loretta Lynch is suspect, okay? And Holder might be suspect as well. But for sure, Loretta Lynch is definitely suspect. Check this out. In July, right on 4th of July, the FBI director explained in great detail why the FBI was not bringing charges against Hillary Clinton uh, and what he thought of all the evidence that they went through while they were considering that decision. Last week, Senator Elizabeth Warren wrote to the FBI director and asked if he would please make the same kind of statement explaining why the FBI didn't recommend charges against the nine bankers who were referred to the Department of Justice for possible prosecution when the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission found that in the financial crisis, those individual nine bankers were involved in possible serious violations of federal laws. Yeah, if you can explain it for the Clinton thing, how about the financial crisis that almost destroyed the world? Hmm. No word back yet from the FBI, we're told. Uh, but then today, the, CEO's, uh, the CEO of the world's most valuable bank he was treated to Senator Warren's tender ministrations at the U.S. Senate as well. This just isn't right. A cashier who steals a handful of 20s is held accountable, but Wall Street executives who almost never hold themselves accountable, not now and not in 2008, when they crushed the worldwide economy. The only way that Wall Street will change is if executives face jail time when they preside over massive frauds. Joining us now for the interview is Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. Senator Warren, thank you very much for making time to talk to us tonight. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so your questioning of the Wells Fargo CEO um, was very uh, heated today, I think is the right word. Why did you decide to roast him over that spit the way you did today at that hearing? Well, why not? I mean, look, here is a guy who says, I'm accountable. And then his notion of accountability is he keeps his job, he keeps the millions of dollars in bonuses that he made while this scam goes on, he keeps all the money from his stock improving because of the scam that was going on, and then blames the scam on uh, more than 5,000 low-level employees and says, oh, he didn't know anything about it. You know, there just comes a point when you have to say, enough, you can't keep doing this. Remember, right at the heart of the 2008 crisis was, in a sense, exactly the same thing. It was that giant financial institutions, not community banks, not credit unions, giant financial institutions figured out that they could make buckets of money by cheating their own customers. Now, the lead up to 2008 was far more elaborate and had lots of people in it and lots of different kinds of financial instruments, but at its heart, that's what it was all about. It was about those mortgages, about those subprime mortgages that tricked people, that trapped people, that fooled people. So what happens? It's eight years later, and Wall Street says, no, 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 we've changed, we've changed, we've changed. And then it comes out that Wells Fargo, the biggest bank in the world, has been out there doing something called cross-selling. And what it really means is they squeeze their employees into their employees' made-up checking accounts and credit card accounts, squeeze them that hard. Why? So they could then go right back to Wall Street and keep pumping their numbers. Pumping their numbers and saying, our stock is worth more and more and more. Our company is worth more and more and more because look at all these accounts we've got. You know, it, there's got to come a time when you say to these CEOs, no. Not only no, but you are going to be held personally responsible for this. As long as these guys can get rich and waltz out the door, nothing on Wall Street is going to change. That personal accountability um, issue is um, something that Wall Street is not 
used to hearing anything other than rhetoric about. They're not used to hearing anything pointed and possible about that prospect. You, but you raised this as well in your letter to the FBI last yeah. week and to the Department of Justice Inspector General saying, listen, if you're willing to go public and explain your reasoning and your rationale for uh, this Hillary Clinton email scandal, what you thought of all the evidence and why you didn't recommend charges in that case, please do so also for these nine bankers who were recommended for possible prosecution because of the financial crisis. Um, why did you decide to go to the FBI about that now? And do you actually think they'll release any of that information? So let's talk about the now. You remember that after the crisis, Congress set up something called the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Mm -hmm. And their job was to go out and to hold hearings and to look at books and records and to get people in and to figure out what went wrong in the crisis. It was bipartisan. And boy, did they get out and work. I mean, they took tons of information in. And then they wrote this great big report, this giant report, and they boxed up all the rest of their papers and records and so on and sent them over to the archives as they were required to do by law, where they were sealed for five years. So, okay, that sounds fine. A few months ago, they became unsealed oh. because it had been five years. So my staffers go over and get the boxes out and start digging through them. And it turns out that the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission had recommended, based on the data they had seen, specific people who should be investigated as having caused the financial crisis and specific financial institutions. So they were referred to the Justice Department. So this isn't like just vaguely, why didn't you hold somebody accountable. They sent over names and they did it based on all of the evidence and data that they had collected. So what happened? What happened? And the answer is basically nothing. So I sent two letters last week. One was I sent it directly to the Inspector General of the Department of Justice and I said, could you please find out what happened to those criminal referrals and you know just kind of let us the rest of us know. But the second was to the director of the FBI, because I listened really closely when he got up and talked about Hillary Clinton. And he had said, you know, the FBI's general policy is if we don't issue an indictment, we don't say anything about it. I understand that. But he said, in effect, there's a new standard. And the new standard is when there is, I believe his words were intense public interest. When there is intense public interest, then, man, we're going to release everything we've got. We're going to go ahead and give you all of the uh, investigative reports and what all happened. I'm going to stand up and do a big press conference, he said. And then he goes over to Capitol Hill and testifies all about it. Okay, if that's the new standard, I believe there is intense public interest in the people and institutions that caused the 2008 financial crisis, that cost millions of people their homes, millions of people their jobs, millions of people their retirement accounts. The Dallas Fed estimates cost this economy $14 trillion. That kind of sounds like intense public interest to me. So I asked him to apply his new standard for the intense public interest cases and release the same kind of information he released in the case of Hillary Clinton and her emails. You haven't heard back from him, have you? Not so far. <laughs> we called the FBI and the Department of Justice and asked uh, if and when they're planning on writing back and they wouldn't tell us either. Senator, uh, do you have a plane to catch or do you mind holding just for one more, for one more second so I can ask you a thing? Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that introduction and hello, Ohio. It is good. <laughs> Senator Elizabeth Warren campaigning this weekend in Ohio for Ted Strickland and his Senate race uh, against Rob Portman in that state. Senator, thanks for sticking with us. I really appreciate sure. it. Um, I talked at the top of the show a little bit about how the, the electoral projections for the Senate right now, some of them including the New York Times and the Washington Post, are both saying that actually the Republicans are more likely than the Democrats to be controlling the Senate next year. Um, based on, on polling right now, we've also seen Hillary Clinton's lead over Donald Trump um, evaporate to a significant extent, both in national polls and swing state polls. What, what is, having been to all these states, campaigning for all these Democratic senators, do you have a diagnosis 
uh, for why that might be happening right now? Do you have a proposed cure for how to fix it? Look, I don't, I, my job is not to diagnose what's done wrong. My job is to get up there and fight back mm -hmm. because that's what we have to do. I mean, let me try just two words for you, Supreme Court. Um, even if Hillary Clinton gets elected, if we can't get a Democratic Senate, then we're going to have trouble confirming someone to the Supreme Court. She's going to have trouble being able to field a team, you know, having someone at the Department of Justice who actually cares about accountability, having someone at the Department of Labor, having people at the Environmental Protection Agency. If Hillary Clinton has to step into the White House on the first day, in opposition to a Congress that is controlled in both houses by Republicans, then she really will have her back against the wall. So my view on this is, number one is to take the White House, uh, uh, to hang on to it with Hillary Clinton, but right behind that, we have got to take back control of the United States Senate. The Supreme Court depends on it, and actually just getting out there and doing the basic work of government depends on it. Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, I do appreciate you sticking with me and for giving us this much time tonight. It's nice to see you. Thank you. Elizabeth Warren, <clears throat> Hillary Clinton fucked up big time. That was the person that she should have put on her team because that was the person who would have been able to get out there, kick some ass, take some names, and then on top of that, she would have been able to pull in the millennials, all right? Because the millennials basically would have, they would have gone along with her, uh, with the, the strength that she projects. With Clinton being able to knock Trump out fairly early based on the strength of Warren, the Senate races, especially the ones in the battleground states, those are the ones that have to be flipped. And right now, it's not looking all that good as far as uh, the Democrats being able to take over the Senate. Uh, McCain was looking a little shaky before, but he firmed up. Florida with Rubio, uh, when he decided to come back in, that knocked that out of the box. But that Ohio race was the one that they should have poured everything, including the kitchen sink, into because uh, Portman was uh, vulnerable. But uh, Strickland wasn't the strongest candidate in the world uh, to uh, go up against them. But even so, if they had really pumped that Ohio race and gotten Strickland in there, Kelly Ott is definitely vulnerable. Uh, the trying to remember the name of the uh, senator in Wisconsin. He's gone. Uh, then you have um, uh, Illinois, uh, Tammy Duckworth. She's uh, running for Senate in uh, Illinois. And uh, pretty much most people believe she's a shoe in for that one. So that would be what? Uh, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, Pennsylvania is uh, is uh, another good uh, opportunity for a pickup. That would be four. They needed Ohio. They needed that seat uh, out of uh, out of Ohio by Strickland because North Carolina it, it looked fairly decent for a while, but now it, it's that thing is more than likely going to uh, remain uh, Republican. And then I indicated previously that. Uh, Arizona's uh, McCain's going to win in Arizona, and uh, Fat Boy uh, Marco Rubio is going to hold on to that seat in Florida, and then they still got to worry about Nevada because, um, oh man, I can't remember the name of the uh, senator from Nevada. Anyway, he's retiring. He was the uh, former, um, he was the um, minority leader in the uh, Senate. Anyway, um, and I could see his face, and he's the one that had the accident, and now he wears the sunglasses all the time. Anyway, he's retiring, and it, it's a push on which way that Senate seat in Nevada is going to go. They can't afford to lose that seat, and they need to pick up four more, and then they need Hillary Clinton to win in order to take the Senate over. But Warren is working her ass off uh, in places that the regular uh, Republic, uh, Democratic hierarchy uh, basically looked like they gave up. And I said this a couple of weeks ago. They were a bunch of female body parts. 
as far as giving up on uh, Strickland. They should have jumped in there and redoubled their efforts to go after Portman. And Elizabeth Warren, uh, she's made of sterner stuff because uh, she's not giving up on anybody. She's all over the place. And I'm wondering where the hell Bernie Sanders is. Now, it's been indicated that he's not necessarily pulling for various senators. He's basically going for downstate races uh, such as the state, uh, state uh, Senate and state House of Representatives uh, positions. And he's come out and I believe he's endorsed like in 10 different states. But he needs to get in there as well. Uh, trying to prop up, at a minimum, he needs to be in there uh, supporting Strickland. He needs to get in there and push like hell for Strickland, even though a bunch of his supporters are probably going to be halfway pissed off at him. He still needs to get in there and at least pitch for him, okay? And he needs to pitch uh, up uh, in uh, New Hampshire um, in the race up there against Kelly Idot. If he only wants to do two, those are the two that he needs to get in there and work his ass off on.